Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's event. I'm Michael Fullilove. I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. Let me first recognise my board member, Mark Ryan, uh, the British High Commissioner, Mena Rawlings, a number of Consuls General and a lot of friends of the Lowy Institute. It's wonderful to see a full house today. Who knew, Alan, that you, there would be such enormous public interest in you and me? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, of course, we know that's not true. We are honoured to have, a, have with us today the 24th Prime Minister of Australia, Paul Keating. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Keating was first elected to the House of Representatives as the member for Blacksland in 1969. He was a minister briefly in the Whitlam government. He served as treasurer from 1983 to 1991 when he became leader of the Labor Party and he served as prime minister from 1991 to 1996. I was lucky enough to work for him as an advisor in the last 18 months or so of his prime ministership. Paul was a reforming treasurer and prime minister whose brushwork on the big picture of liberal economic policy, engagement with Asia, native title and the Republic was always applied with imagination and courage. And in the two decades since he's left office, he's continued to make important and sometimes lethal interventions in the national debate, often on the question of Australia's place in the world. I believe he is also the only Prime Minister who has had a musical written about him. So welcome, Paul Keating. <laughs> Let me also welcome Alan Gingell, one of Australia's most distinguished practitioners of foreign policy and now also an historian of Australian foreign policy. In 1969, in the same year that Paul was elected to represent Blacksland in the House of Representatives, Alan joined the then Department of External Affairs, making him part of the famed <coughs> class of 69. He served as a diplomat in Rangoon, Singapore and Washington. He was an analyst in the Office of National Assessments a senior official in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and from 1993 to 1996, he was international advisor in Paul's office. From 2003 to 2009, he was the first executive director of the Lowy Institute and my boss in our beautiful sandstone clubhouse just down the road, which in a previous incarnation was actually Paul's post-prime ministerial office. Alan then served as director general in the Office of National Assessments until 2013. And he's now ensconced at the ANU in various roles, including director of the Crawford Australian Leadership Forum, <coughs> which is coming up in June. Alan is here today, and the excuse for this event is uh, his publication of this important new book, Fear of Abandonment, published by Black Inc., which is a history of Australian foreign policy from 1941 to, to 2016. And let me acknowledge Maury Schwartz, the publisher of Black Ink, who is with us today. Alan, we're delighted to have you back here at the Institute, particularly as you brought Catherine and Dom with you. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Alan Gingell and Paul Keating. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a conversation up here on the stage, and at some point uh, I will come to the audience for a few questions. So, please put your thinking caps on now. Let me begin with you, Paul, if I can. In the, 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 the central theme of Alan's book is that a principal driver of Australian foreign policy is our fear of being abandoned by great and powerful friends. So can I ask you, do you recognise that in, in your reading of the history of Australian foreign policy? How important is that as a, as a theme and what are the other big themes in Australian foreign policy? Well, I, th I think that's been the primary theme. Like Alan's been right to identify it, and he and he's got a, 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 and the, the the title of the book says it all. Uh, um, as he says in the book, uh, this all began with um, imperial adventurism in the first place. You know, uh, what he calls the uh, the audacious claim to a continent. Here we, here we arrive, <clears throat> you know, four hundred yards away from here. Um, in a couple of little wooden boats and we claim the Australian continent. It's pretty audacious. Uh, and uh, 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 and uh, we, uh, and of course we, being a, a, a got a lot of good little Britons, we continued with, uh, with the whole idea of the British Empire <clears throat> until of course uh, the search for a strategic guarantor, until of course it let us down in Singapore in 1942. So then we then found another guarantor, the United States. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, you know, we, we were dragged to Asia by the Second World War. Uh, 
Um, some, as Alan points out, some of us learned that lesson and some of us didn't, you know. I've always believed we had to find our security in Asia and not from Asia. Uh, but also I think Alan charts the internationalism which we had, you know. Um, I mean, even the mere fact we were looking for a strategic guarantor meant we were, we were not closed. We were out there, at least mm. on the highways and byways. And he records in the book, uh, you know, the things which we've done in the post-war years. Uh, uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Cambodia Peace Accords, uh, the APEC structure, including the leaders' meetings, you know, uh, the G20, um, Kevin's involvement with that, and the East Asia Summit. You know. Now, I think it's getting harder for us to do those things, but, but, but what, what's fe- the underlying thing is what fed it all is fear of abandonment and, of course, this, you know, uh, uh, quasi-religious view now, this sacramental view we now have of the American alliance, you know, um, is, f- is fed by that. <clears throat> I'm going to come back and, and ask you about the alliance and also about our relationship with China. But let me bring you in, Alan, um, and, and maybe, I guess, tell us why it is that you wanted to write this book. I was struck by a comment you made, I think, in the introduction. You say that the story Australians know best of their country's engagement with the world is one of war and battles, from Gallipoli to the Western Front to Kokoda and Vietnam, right through to Afghanistan, war is central to Australians' image of their nation in the world. Whereas you write, there is something about foreign policy that has always made Australians a little uncomfortable. The ceaselessly interactive processes of foreign policy, the adjustments and compromises it requires, the close attention it demands, its backroom dimensions, its unheroic nature. These don't sit easily with Australians. Is it that Australians feel uncomfortable about foreign policy or is it just that they get a bit bored by it? Uh, Because I'm struck that in many countries um, there's something about uh, the history of war and fighting that's more immediate and and visceral than the history of, of foreign policy. Yeah, no, that, that's obviously uh, that's obviously right. There, there's a sort of a, a general um, uh, a, a general reality that stories of uh, stories of battle and heroism are more interesting than uh, than stories of diplomacy and. Um, uh, you know, Peter Weir's film Gallipoli is always going to do better than Peter Weir's film The Negotiation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, <laughs> um, uh, for, you know, for obvious reasons. But I, but I, did, I did want to write uh, the book because it has always uh, frustrated me uh, that the world that Australians actually live in uh, today, the world where China is our largest uh, uh, trading partner, where the United States is our close ally, uh, where we belong to, uh, you know, the, to the G- largest, uh, you know, the group of the top 20 uh, countries in, in, in the world. The, these are things which shape our daily lives but have, have not been set on the uh, battlefields of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Middle East or, or, or the South Pacific, a, 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 an entirely different set of dynamics. And um, I may be... Uh, un- unusual in this, I think I probably am unusual, but I find this set of dynamics as interesting uh, as the, as the uh, military set. Paul, <clears throat> in Fear of Abandonment, Alan writes of you that Keating's view of the world was one international relations theorists would recognise as realist. Economic weight mattered and power moved the international order. He says, as Prime Minister, he had little interest in the raw intelligence that can titillate some politicians, what mattered was the big picture. And in this regard, you're a little different from some Labor foreign policy makers who are more focused perhaps on institutions and perhaps questions of, of human rights. So what was the big picture for you on foreign policy when you served as Prime Minister? Well, I had a great start, of course. I wasn't a lawyer. So, <laughs> uh, 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 so that meant I had a much bigger field of view. Um, uh, and legalism has informed these yep. institutional issues far too much in Australian terms. Now, I uh, well, at the core, uh, I think I think Alan's description of me is right. I mean, um, power comes from economic agglomerations, and we saw these shifts of power uh, uh, from 
from Britain to Europe and then from Europe to the United States in the last gasp of the 19th century and the turn of the 20th century and we've now seen the same great influence happen where you've got a shift of economic power from the west to the east and in broad economic terms at least a sharing of economic power between the United States and China but broadly from the west to the east. And so therefore, you know, when these things happen, the strategic settings change, you know. Um, there's another thing I think, you know, you pick up ideas in public life. And wh one of the things I think I picked up was that great states need strategic space. And if you don't give it to them, they'll take it. Uh, and this has been true of all the ones, Britain, the United States, Germany, etc., Japan... Uh, and uh, you can see it now to some extent with China. So I think these things drive, drive, uh, drive, drive um, uh, a policy uh, and, uh, and also just having um, a clear idea about motive, people's motives, mm -hmm. you know, looking beho behind the screen mm. and, uh, and seeing what people really mean, what, what their aspirations are really about. Um, as, well, they're the sort of things I used to focus on. Well, let me draw you out <coughs> on that question of, of, of personality. One of the strengths of um, Alan's book is that he brings to life some of the characters uh, in the history of Australian foreign policy. And I was speaking to you last week and, and you were saying that, that two of the individuals that influence, influence you a lot as a young man were Churchill and Roosevelt. <coughs> what was it about those two characters and the way that they view that viewed the world that you learned from, that blew your hair back, as it were? Oh, well, Churchill was an adventurer, and fundamentally I'm an adventurer too. So I liked, I liked him, you know. Um, but the thing I... And, but he had the commanding view of Europe. The, the great thing about him was the moral clarity. You know? I mean, he got the job. The Tory party gave him the job. Uh, fundamentally to do a deal with Hitler. This was... Halifax and, and uh, not so much Chamberlain, but certainly Halifax and that group. And he, he, his, his job, unstated, was to negotiate a position with the Nazis where the Nazis would have hegemony over Western Europe, Britain would be allowed to keep its empire but not its navy. And to that question he said no. You see, and on that no went, went West, Western civilization. I mean, the key thing about Churchill, Churchill didn't win... The Second World War, but at the critical moment, he didn't lose. It. He didn't lose it. Yeah? Uh, on the other hand, Roosevelt, um, <clears throat> apart from taking America out of the collapse of of, of the Golden Age uh, uh, and uh, of uh, so-called Golden Age of um, of uh, capital of capital um, uh, robber baron capital uh, and reconstructing some basis of confidence and viability in the US economy, it was Roosevelt who determined at the Atlantic Charter that he would do all that he could to put an end to colonialism. And this was the point that he and Churchill fell out on because Churchill thought the British would go back to India after the war, you know, the Dutch would go back to Indonesia, the French to Indochina... And Roosevelt had no bar of that. And this was why he was so accommodating to the Soviet Union when he was building the UN structure, you know. So he just had a... In the end, Roosevelt had a much bigger worldview than, than Churchill had. But the two of them were fantastic. You know? What about in Australian history? When, when you were serving as Prime Minister, were there Prime Ministers that you'd looked back on in terms of the way they managed Australian foreign policy and you thought that was something very impressive that that PM did? No, there's nothing ever very impressive about Australian foreign policy. <laughs> no, 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 that's the truth of it, you know. That's the truth of it. I mean, there's nothing impressive about it. Uh, 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 the, the best we've ever done was, of course, Curtin and his, his, his arrangements with the Americans in the prosecution of the war. But look at Menzies and Suez, you know. I mean, it was a desire. Look at him again in Vietnam, you know what I mean? Um, or the confrontation in Indonesia, you know. I mean, these are not anything that you'd yodel about, are they? Um, um, and uh, 
the, the break, I suppose the break is, say, Whitlam's recognition of China and his determination to have a relationship with Asia and China is the first real sign, because Alan makes a point. This all starts with the Treaty of Westminster, which is, what, 1943, isn't it? 42. 42. So we, we, before that, you've got Casey saying the foreign policy of Great Britain is the foreign policy of Australia, you know? Uh, you know, that was, that's where we were. Um, and so there's much now made by the Libs about the American alliance, but it was like putting your foot into an old shoe by that stage, you know. Of course, we had... I mean, in those, face, you know, in those days, there weren't, there weren't many sort of European societies with a big continent like us, so there's no way the Americans were going to let us go, you know. I mean, it wouldn't have taken too much effort, I don't think, to sort that one out. So you say, well, what are the big things in Australian foreign policy? Well, I, I think scrambling off the ground, getting uh, the APEC structure together, getting uh, uh, the East Asia Summit together, um, uh, Kevin's involvement with the G20, are the first bloom, if you like, of Australian foreign policy, but in a much more independent frame of mind, where, where, where self-reliance and self-starting is the motivation, not sitting back waiting for a friend, as we're still doing, to tell us where we should go. Alan, let me bring you in. What do you think are the most impressive um, points in the history of Australian foreign policy? What, what is it that, that impressed you when you were writing this book? Um, foreign policy is like any, any other sort of, sort of policy. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the things you're looking for are people who recognise that a moment of change has come, who then have views on what should be done about it and have the uh, leadership capacity then to drive that uh, change forward. And, um, you know, in, in Australian um, foreign policy history, you'd look, I think, at uh, what Evans did at San Francisco. I think you'd look at what Spender, Spender did with um, Colombo Plan and, uh, and, um, and ANZUS. Uh, Whitlam on the recognition of uh, of uh, uh, of China. Well, uh, Paul's been through a lot of them. Uh, um, APEC. I'd add. Um, I'd add, which I wouldn't have done at the time, but I would now add after having uh, looked at it. Um, uh, John Howard and uh, and uh, and East Timor and the way that uh, that was handled. It didn't end up where anyone expected it to end up, but I think it was. Uh, I think it was. Uh, Important um, and uh, G G20, I agree as as well. As All right, and let me ask you a similar question to the one I, I put to Paul. Um, who do you think have been the most impressive and effective figures in the history of Australian foreign policy, both ministers or PMs, but also officials? As someone who was associated with the now Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for much of its existence, who who really stands out for you as as really impressive, exceptional individuals? Uh, uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the ministerial side, I think the the ones I've I've named really um, uh, 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 Evert, you know, the sort of nightmare to deal with in many many ways. But but uh, but when he was on his uh, game, he made absolute uh, uh, changes. Uh, Spender because he basically ignored Menzies. I mean, I think Menzies was really. Um, uh, wrong on almost every one of the big changes during the during the fifties and sixties, and his minister, the, the ministers who were successful were those who worked around him, like McEwen and like uh, and uh, like uh, Spender, um, uh, Barwick to an extent uh, um, as, as well. Uh, Whitlam, although I think Whitlam stuffed up badly on East, on in, in the response to the. Uh, independence of uh, to the um, uh, Indonesian invasion of uh, of uh, East Timor um, uh, in their different ways, um, uh, uh, Hawk and um, well, I, I have a vested interest in the man sitting beside me, but uh, I think uh, um, obviously him of officials. Um, um, sort of hard to say. These are not figures known to many people, but people like uh, um, uh, 
uh, Tom Critchley, um, Arthur, Arthur Tang, I think, uh, 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 preeminently among them. Uh, Hasluck was a brilliant official but a lousy minister, um, uh, which is uh, which you, 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 you mightn't have expected. Paul, you mentioned the alliance earlier and the question of independence and, and self-reliance. And, of course, you got a lot of uh, attention at the end of last year when you said that Australia should cut the tag with the United States. But, of course, you yourself have a long history of, of defending the alliance in other forums, in the forum of the Labor Party over many decades. And, and I know one of your uh, motivations in trying to stand up the APEC leaders' meeting was to... to to ensure the United States remains engaged with, with the region. So what did you mean when you said Australia should cut the tag with the United States? And how important do you think the alliance is to Australia's national interests? Well, the cut the tag was in the... It was a flow, a flow of thoughts and words. I said, we've got tag-along rights and we should cut the, cut the tag, meaning we should have rights which are not tag-along rights. By cutting the tag, I didn't mean cut the alliance. Mm. But, of course, the way... Stuff's reported in Australia, all sorts of things. No, look, the, the, the Alliance, if we had no document uh, anymore, uh, we would remain friends with the United States into the future, you know. Uh, we've been in every battle, as everyone knows, since, since, 19, since the First World War. Um, we've got a whole lot of cultural and uh, historic uh, common ground. Um, and so... The idea, but the idea that we have to, uh, th 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 that as a sort of client state, we have to shape up all the time or ship out. In other words, the view which is pretty much in, ingrained these days in Canberra, that is, you know, we have to sort of get along with them, otherwise they'll shoo us away. Uh, I mean, l look at the French attacks upon the United States over Iraq. And yet France enjoys a normal relationship with the United States today. Um, the Canadians the same. Uh, but this idea that we've got to, we, that we've got to be, you, you know, um, uh, that we've got to sort of, you know, um, be the Uriah heaps of this world, you know, uh, dragging along behind them, um, uh, whereas, whereas we should be running an altogether independent foreign policy and much more independence within this alliance structure. But, but the, the idea that, uh, you know, that, that, that we need signals from, uh, from Washington to, uh, to or, or we get caught up in another one of their skirmishes. I mean, I had one of these American diplomats in to see me recently. I said, look, you guys got a little bit of self-reflection and do well with you fellas, you know? I mean, <laughs> Vietnam, there was never the downward thrust of Chinese communism through Vietnam. There's a thousand years of history to tell you why that wasn't right, you know. But I said, before you did that, you knocked off the Labor Party Prime Minister of Iran, Mossadegh, and brought in Shah Reza Pahlavi. And we know where that ended, you know. And on the way through, you made sure you pushed Indira Gandhi into the hands of the Soviet Union. I wouldn't have regarded that as a particularly clever trick, you know. Um, and, 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 and so it goes, and of course we're finally with Iraq. So the, the idea, this is a state which has done fantastic things for the world, but also makes mistakes. And therefore Australia should be running, to, to, to putting its interests first, and within, a, within the context of this alliance, which is never going to go, fade away, you know. The point is the United States is entirely important to the to the governance of East Asia. Um, it's important they remain in this part of the world and a force. Uh, I, you know, I, I've, I've, I've always thought that. But the Americans had a chance at the end of the Cold War of reshaping the world, you know, but, but they completely failed the opportunity, you know. Uh, if I were them, and I said this to Bill Clinton at the time, the United States should have framed and guarantor. They should have been the framer and guarantor of the Atlantic. Right? They had the pond itself, the Atlantic. They had NATO. They had the European Union. The one task for them was to bring Russia into Europe, and they would have consolidated their power in there. But they can never be the framer and the guarantor in Asia. In Asia, they should be the balancer and the conciliator, because the idea that 
that China is going to be a, a strategic client of the United States is nonsense. It's, it's nonsense. I mean, China is returning to where it was before the Industrial Revolution. It's returning to being the primary economic state in the world. Um, and it's now a long way on that task, right? And what they're doing in the South China Sea, they're marking out the space like a tiger does. You know, the tiger mark, rubs, rubs itself against the trees and let anyone that, any other ones turn up. This is our space, right? Um, to which, and of course the Americans have taken the same view about Cuba and the Caribbean and what have you. Uh, but, and of course, as we know, any American cruiser could take out each of those emplacement on these islets the Chinese have created, you know, in an, in an instant. So strategically, they don't matter. But, but the point is, the Chinese are trying to superintend the corner of one ocean, and the Americans are trying to superintend three oceans, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the thing. It can't be done, and it won't happen. So the pivot, which I criticised on the night it was announced, was bound to fail and will fail. Uh, and uh, this is why, uh, nor, but nor do we want China to be the dominant state in East Asia. This is why we need the, the United States here, as the sort of as the floating good guys, you know, floating their boats around. I mean, I always say to these American admirals, you know, every great battleship went down in the first week at sea in the Second World War, you know. The Bismarck, the Tirpitz, the Amato, uh, and when Churchill sent the renowned and repulse to Malaysia, it wasn't their first week at sea, but their first conflict, they went down too. Just like these American carriers are going to go down when, the real, when, a, a, when a nasty fight starts. And I said to this admiral, they all sound the same, you know, in the end. He, he said, what do you mean? I said... Glug, 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 <laughs> glug. Um, and, and, of course, this is, this is forced projection. There's, there's, an, there's an important point to make here, that, that in these Westphalian systems of balance, what constitutes balance within a sort of Westphalian-type structure, Europe and America had more or less had that <clears throat> as a sort of a, repli a replication of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> after you know, after after the Charlemagne returned, after the Huns and the Visigoths, the shape of Europe broadly remem broadly aped the Roman Empire, um, and there was a natural balance of states within it. But Asia, Asia's never been like that. It's always been a hierarchy with China at the top, you know, uh, and so uh, therefore. Um, uh, In this part of the world, um, we've, what constitutes balance, what constitutes a Westphalian system of balance in East Asia is hard to know, but it should include the United States. But there is one important fact about East Asia that never, was never true about Europe, that when Bismarck put together that system of alliances he had, Germany was a central state in the metropolitan zone of Europe. The United States is not a state in the metropolitan zone of East Asia. It's on the other side of the Pacific. And so its projection is force projection and of course it's strategic projection. So I hold the view that that the shape of Asia will never that Asia will never be reshaped by a non Asian power and certainly not, not by the application of American military force. If we accept that point that means we keep the Americans as the floating good guys. Uh, we keep them in a the balancing role, but we determine a foreign policy of our own that looks after Australia's interest in the new order. The new order, which will have China at the center, as the centre of gravity. What about all of China's neighbours? Do they have to accept China's prerogatives, for example, in the South China Sea? Um, well, they, they, they can't. They probably won't, but they'll probably do a trade with the Chinese, you know, Pro probably come to some, some, some settlement with them. But the idea, though, that we go steaming through the South China Sea in settlement of these... I mean, look at, look at the, uh, the Philippines president, 
uh, and his attitude, uh, that we go steaming through in a fight that's not our fight. You know, this is not our fight. You know? So telling the Americans this is not our fight, we're not in it, you know, is, uh, is something just we should do. You know? But of course, the problem is, and this is particularly true of the current government, it has an attitude to the United States and our relationship with it which is not at any way at odds with that which obtained in the Cold War. Nothing has changed for them. You know? It's as if China hasn't happened, you know, this great state rising in the east and its magnetic power, both strategic and economic power. Um, uh, and this bit of nonsense that Howard used to go on with, oh, we don't have to choose between China and the United States. Well, we're choosing every day. You know, the choices are on all the time. Um, so, you know, the ch China has walked away from... Uh, I mean, there's a very important point to make here, I think. China believes in globalisation, but it doesn't believe in globalism. And what, what the Americans set up was a system of... a global system at the end of the Cold War, which didn't have a very long life. It went from... It went from 1989 to 2009, you know. This was the end of history, the Washington Consensus, uh, and, of course, it all blew up with the financial crisis in 2008 when the Chinese were called in to get the checkbook out and try and save the world, you know, at the G20. Uh, so the Chinese will not accept a place in an ordered American system, an exclusive American system, which is set up around Atlantic institutions. Now, that is all over. Yeah. Let me ask you, one thing that has changed is that we have a different kind of president sitting in the Oval Office, one who over many years expressed uh, views on alliances and free trade and the US role in the world that put him quite at odds with pretty much every president since the end of the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, I was very interested that, um, again, I think in that same interview uh, at the end of last year, you said that Mr Trump had at least two good foreign policy ideas. You said, what, first, to get on better with China, and second, to get on better with Russia. So three months into his presidency, how do you think President Trump's foreign policy is shaping up? Well, I, I've taken some heart from the fact he seemed to have developed a reasonable relationship with Xi Jinping and this meeting they had in Florida. And also the fact that the Chinese have put their hand up again to do something about North Korea uh, is giving the Trump administration some sucker and support, which, which I think is very good. Um, you see, the strategic... Co the competition between the United States and China in, in the Pacific, in, the, in a broad sense, is, I think, almost over. Almost over. I mean, no important or sensible American thinks that China is going to become a strategic client of the United States as envisaged in the Nixon-Mao deal. The Nixon-Mao deal was created to deal with Soviet divisions on China's borders. When the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, the underpinnings of the Nixon-Mao deal fell away. Except the Chinese were not powerful enough to push the Americans away then, but they're powerful enough now. So, and you can just see American impotence at the fact that notwithstanding the pivot which President Obama announced in our parliament, and the fact that the Chinese have now built these islets in the South China Sea, you know, they, they gave the Americans a test. They said, we're going to go and we're going to build these islets. And the Americans fundamentally failed the test. You know, uh, uh, Obama made a hairy-chested speech about it in Tokyo and nothing, nothing else happened. So that, 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 I think, is it will never be written in a document. We'll never find a document which has agreement between the prerogatives and the powers of the United States and China and the Pacific, it'll never be written. This will only become from testing and understandings. The Chinese have done their testing. They think they had Obama's measure, you know. The islets are a fact of life now. China's real story is in the west, down the Silk Road. It's not in the east, yeah. 
and 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 of course the idea of any American infantry on the Chinese mainland is a, is a joke. I mean, the, the central stabilising force in East Asia is China, not Japan. Is China, and I think. This will dawn on the Americans, so we're already reaching that point of understanding, I think. Therefore, if Trump can get on better with, or get on well enough with uh, Xi Jinping and find common cause in things, I think that's good. So that's a good idea. Uh, Russia, he had the right idea about Russia. I mean, the Americans should never have expanded NATO uh, 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 you know, I did a speech at the University of New South Wales at the time Alan and I were discussing this, and we used to say to the Americans, you know, this is a great mistake. You know, biting off bits of the pie crust off the Soviet Union was bound to create a reaction, and of course they, they created Putin in a way. So the great challenge for Europe and the United States in any consolidation of the Atlantic... Um, given that they can't consolidate Asia, has to be a settlement of some kind between Russia and Europe. Uh, maybe a guy like Trump can do it because no one else ever wanted to do it. Not Clinton, not George W, not Obama, you know? So, so I give him marks for that. Um, I mean, a lot of people disparage him, but he beat Hillary and he's got the job. So... What you've got to do now is work out what you can do with him. But one thing is not one thing not to do with the Americans is keep bowing down. This is just bad behaviour. Bad, bad, bad behaviour. Alan, let me bring you in. You quote in your book uh, a, f a friend and colleague of ours, Peter Varghese, in a speech in 2015 when he said, ha Australia has shied away from the exercise of power. We have tended to see power as belonging to others. And when we have engaged with the projection of power, we've traditionally been more comfortable in the slipstream than in the lead. Why is that? Why, why don't you hear Australian politicians talking about power much, do you think? I think it's uh, thought to be bad form. Um, I think there's a... Uh, there's a, a um, it uh, goes back partly to Paul's point about uh, tagging along, a view that we will leave others to shape the world uh, for us and when the message gets uh, through to us, we'll, we'll go along and, uh, and follow on. There have been in those, uh, that sort of list I gave before of Australian foreign policy achievements, there are not, all, n not enough of them are examples of Australia deciding for itself what it wants in the world and then working out how to get there. Now, we're never going to be able to get there in the same way that the United States or China can get there because we don't have that uh, uh, power. We have to put together uh, co coalitions of, uh, of interests in, in the world and to shape our way uh, more, uh, more cunningly um, uh, than that. And I think there's been insufficient confidence in our, in our ability to, to do that. Uh, it takes time and, uh, and effort uh, to do it and um, it requires political leaders who are prepared to expend political capital and time to, to do these things, as uh, Paul did with the APEC leaders uh, uh, meeting and, uh, and, you know, People get distracted in, in Canberra, you know, other things come on the table. The Daily Telegraph uh, headline this morning was talking about something else and you, and you go off and do it. And let me ask you one other question and then I'm going to give the audience an opportunity to ask a question. Um, you mentioned the APEC leaders meeting. Um, prior to the creation of the APEC leaders meeting, I think I'm right in saying that the, the principal regular meetings that the Prime Minister of Australia attended were the South Pacific Forum and Chogham, I think. Mm, sure. um, now the, the Prime Minister has a radically different travel schedule. And as you say in the book, it's completely seems normal and unsurprising that we would host the leaders of the G20 countries, the, the 20 most weighty economically e economic countries in the world, but also the East Asia Summit and the whole Asian Summit season. How much has this changed uh, 
the, the, the role of the Prime Minister in foreign policy? Does it create extra opportunities for an Australian Prime Minister to be imaginative, the fact that he or she is bumping into counterparts all, all the time? Oh, it, it, it absolutely uh, does. And, the, and uh, uh, Chogham, the Commonwealth Heads of Government uh, uh, meeting, which was the, the sort of the... Uh, which remains really the, the sort of the last um, tenuous uh, vestiges of imperial, uh, of imperial conferences had a deleterious effect for, for, um, uh, a, uh, for decades in Australian uh, foreign policy because the only opportunity that the Australian Prime Minister had to tread on the world stage was at, at meetings of, uh, of Chogham and this was entirely uh, uh, distortionary. Uh, of the uh, priorities that Australia had. With the advent of APEC leaders meeting and since then the East Asia uh, summit, the, G, the G20, um, there's an inbuilt incentive within the Australian system at the centre, within the Prime Minister's uh, of, office and, uh, and department to start looking out on this, uh, on this largest uh, stage. So it's a very good and uh, positive thing for Australia, but it just... People need to uh, grab the opportunities that are there and utilise them. All right. Let me so let me go to the audience and give you an opportunity to ask a question either of Mr. Keating or Mr. Gingell. Um, there are microphones uh, in the room, and I'm going to ask you to wait until um, a microphone comes, and then if you can then mention your name and your affiliation. If you can limit yourself to a question rather than a statement, that would be great. I saw this gentleman first. If you could just wait for a microphone, sir. Paul Patterson from Digital Economics Advisory. Uh, a question for Mr Keating, uh, and thanks both the panellists for a, a wonderful insight into foreign policy. Mr Keating, you said great states need strategic space. Just what do you mean by that and how do they achieve it? Well, uh, the, 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 they, they certainly, let me put the corollary, they, they certainly reject containment, you know. Um, uh, and you, you can see this with you can see this with uh, uh, the, well perhaps in in the 18th century the most important power in the world Britain not only did it have preserve its own strategic space around the British Isles but of course it it projected that through naval power all through all through uh, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and then ultimately into the Pacific. Um, uh, you can see you can see it with uh, we can see it with Germany. Um, you can see it with Russia. Uh, Russia, Russian foreign policy is all about all about the shock absorber down the northern European plain. You know the plain that Bonaparte came across into into Moscow. Um, that Hitler came across, and of course that the Red Army came back into Berlin over. You know, and it's all, it's all about where that where that goes. I mean, the NATO's border was what 1,200 miles from Moscow. It's now 70 miles. So Russia's concerned all the time about that, and that's why that's why uh, we, we 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 found that in the end, they, of course, they would they couldn't accept the Ukraine, the the offers by the European unions and the Americans, the Ukrainians. You know, so you see it there, and you can see it with China. Uh, you know. You know, who who knows in history where where China's old boundaries were or were obtained, but China is was always the great central state of East Asia, and and it it had its strategic space by virtue of the deferent system it created. You know, China China was they regarded themselves as the central kingdom of the world, the central state. And the other states were derivative states, you know, so they had it. And, and you can see China doing it now. To the east, they've put, they've marked the tiger space out on the islands. And to the west, they're now going down with the belt and the road, the belt particularly, where they're going to develop road and rail infrastructure and national projects through the, the 57 countries between themselves and Baltic the Baltic coast of Poland. So they're going to expand Chinese strategic and economic power 
down those road, down the down through those places. Um, so uh, one of our issues in the world is that the United States has never had to deal with a state as large as itself. You know, and its whole idea about its exceptionalism uh, to deal with a state which has been always organised on different principles. And so therefore, this whole respect for the, the prerogatives of a great power are an important informant in policy. I think that's my point. Let me go to Ewan Graham from the Lowy Institute. Thank you. My uh, question goes to, um, to both Mr Keating and, uh, and to Mr Gingell. Um, Mr Keating, when you were Prime Minister, you were associated with the attack on the cultural cringe. If it's not traducing your position on the alliance, it sounds rather like it's a strategic cringe that you're um, finding fault with. If that's the case, uh, are we culturally equipped, and the mindset is essentially the problem, are we culturally equipped to, fall, to avoid falling into the trap of a strategic cringe towards China? Well, well, I, I should certainly hope so. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, Alan records me saying in the book, and I used to say this to the Cabinet, when they were giving out continents, not many people got one. But we got one. You know, we have a border with no one. A border with nobody. Um, and so, therefore, we don't have the kind of disputes, the ceremonial disputes that most states have. China, well, look at the number of countries on its border. Any of the great powers I've just mentioned, save for the United States, which has got Canada and Mexico, we don't have these issues, right? So, therefore, it gives us enormous flexibility and, and also... There's a rising centre of economic gravity in Southeast Asia as well, particularly in Indonesia, right? So we can make our way in this part of the world. And I've, I've been saying for years, Southeast Asia and the, the ASEAN group of states is where we should be devoting much more time and attention. But, but um, that, that said, the economic rise of China is without precedent in human history. We've never seen anything like it and never will. And we haven't seen it at its full bloom yet. Uh, I made the point in the interview you mentioned, I said, you know, when we went to school, uh, the teachers would often put iron filings on a piece of paper and put a magnet underneath and very quickly all the iron filings would, would line up in the magnetic field of the, of the magnet. That, that will happen in this part of the world. Now... We will line up in the magnetic field in economic terms as well. Uh, and it's important that we're able to because China's going to have enormous influence in the shape, economic shape, of this part of the world. Uh, but China is, a, is a, a big, lonely state and it's always looking for friends. And therefore, if we conduct, go back to the business of creating Apex and East Asia summits and we start thinking again, you know, in, in say, somewhere like ASEAN, for instance, we could do a lot with ASEAN. You know, we could, we could make that whole thing work much better. They would be happy we were making it work better. The United States would be happy if it was working better. In other words, self-reliance and helping ourselves should be the keynote of our foreign policy, you know. And we don't want to become a tributary of China in the old tributary system they had in the 17th and 18th century. You know, we've got to resist that. And we don't want China being the predominant, the sole predominant economic power. That's why it's so important for the United States to remain involved in the Western Pacific. So important, you know. So a clever state does this dance. It's only the dumb states that get caught up in the, get caught up in some, you know, uh, signalling system of the kind we've always seemed to found ourselves in. You know, Alan, do you want to come back on that question as well, or not? Uh, no, I think that that's, that's fine. all right. Let me call on Mena Rawlings, the High Commissioner from the UK. Thank you very much to both of you. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I might take 
uh, issue, Alan, with your uh, comments about Chogham another time. We can, uh, we we can, can debate that, the Commonwealth's oh, relevance long discussion else, about elsewhere. <laughs> I know, I look forward to it. But my question, um, I've got two, if I may. Uh, one is for you, Alan. I've heard a lot about power and interest. What role do you see for values in Australian foreign policy today? Uh, and how might that affect some of these big relationships with China, Russia and the US? And uh, for Mr. <coughs> Keating, I'd just love to know, what would you like Malcolm Turnbull to say to President Trump on USS Intrepid on the 4th of May? Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. <coughs> um, uh, well, uh, l l let me start with values. Um, in, a, in a democracy, I don't think a foreign co policy can be devoid of values. Uh, you know, raison d'etat is not going to cut it. Uh, for any uh, public like uh, Australia, so values are important. Uh, values uh, and interests are sometimes defined as sharply different. They're not. There are certainly uh, you can we can certainly see v values which are also uh, in Australia's interest. But there also there are also distinctions between uh, between values and interests. We value democracy, uh, but. You can't trade away uh, um, uh, absolutes, um, and and so uh, values are less <coughs> useful in the routine work of diplomacy than uh, than uh, uh, interests are. Values are the way we define ourselves, but they're not uh, ne necessarily the way in which we uh, shape our relationships um, with. Uh, uh, with others. Uh, China is, I think, highly unlikely in my lifetime or uh, that, of, that of my children to become a Jeffersonian uh, democracy, but I don't see that as an impediment to our uh, dealing with and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and developing a close relationship uh, with them. Look, I would say if I was Turnbull, I would, I would encourage, uh, encourage uh, Trump to grow the kind of relationship he seems to be beginning with Xi Jinping, uh, to accept the legitimacy of China. Now, the rise of China is a completely legitimate event, you know, and it doesn't suit the United States or Australia for it, for it to be delegitimised because of US strategic interests. So I'd say the most important thing for Australia is that the is that there is peace in the Pacific between the two major powers. And that's what I would be encouraging Trump to do, more of what seems to be a natural inclination. Paul, can I follow up and ask you about Europe? Um, we've talked a lot about Asia, but of course you're a great fan of European culture. Um, and it's been a pretty tough year for Europe. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to pick on MENA, but, but obviously Britain has decided to exit the European Union. Yeah. Where will that leave Europe as a... Will that make Europe stronger or weaker? And what kind of role can we hope for Europe to play in, in the globe in years to come? Well, it'll leave Europe weaker, in my opinion. Uh, Britain, Britain was the, centra, the second most powerful country uh, in the European Union, and it brought with it a whole lot of strategic kit, intelligence, uh, nuclear weapons, you know, centuries of centuries of sort of strategic history. Um, th that's not to say, of course, Britain can't have a, a conducive relationship on these matters with with Europe, but it's not like being in the actually inside, you know. So um, uh, Europe, um, the Americans are going. The Marshall Plan and all that came out of the Second World War, modern, the shape of modern Europe has been in large measure their creation, but then they let it go at the end of the Cold War. You know, they took no interest in the development of the Euro. Um, I mean, the peripheral countries should never have been the Euro. I, I wrote to Mitterrand uh, and to Cole in 1996. Uh, was it? No, it might have been, wasn't 90, it wasn't Mitterrand, but Cole and his successor um, saying, that the euro should be built around uh, France, Germany, and the Benelux countries, you know, and that we should repel borders until then and bring them in later on, because uh, 
if, if you hitch up the peripheral states, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, to the German productivity train, um, and you have a one price fits all monetary policy and a single currency, all the adjustments, all the depreciations, which they used to do by the currencies, have to be internal. So wages and unemployment, property values, the adjustment occurs, but it occurs in a very, very bad way. And so this has happened all across the peripheral countries now. Um, whereas, because in the end, the euro is too expensive for Italy, too expensive for Greece, too expensive for uh, all these countries. So I don't really think that and of course, nearly all of the countries where, where these referendums, a referendum have tested uh, questions of sovereignty, they've been voted down. So, so the, the multilateral construct of Europe is, is looking, looking much weaker, particularly with Britain out, um, and with the euro still, uh, and there is, there is a monetary union, there is no fiscal union, there's no banking union, you know? And the Americans have got no influence there, as, as they've got strategic influence, but they've had no economic influence in it. In the meanwhile, of course, you've got Mr. Putin, who's now angry about their circumstances, and, and all of that's just bad karma for, for Europe, you know? Um, so, Europe is not what it looked like 20 years ago when the champions of United Europe were there. Now it looks, I think, a much weaker construct uh, with, the, with Germany carrying the burden of, of its management, you know. And this is why the current French election is so important uh, about the outcome. So, you know, I don't, I don't think the EU is going to collapse, but the euro cannot go on the way it is. Let me ask you finally, just to bring it back to Australian foreign policy, I asked you initially about characters in history that had really impressed you. Yeah. What about the Prime Ministers and the Presidents that you dealt with as Prime Minister? If you could choose yeah. one figure that really left his mark on you, that really impressed you, who would you choose? Well, there were two. I'd have to say two. You're allowed to, yep. Helmut Kohl, because he saw the opportunity of a united Germany and he managed Gorbachev with... with with a, pl a plum and dexterity, and he negotiated with the Americans to pull the wall down, and to see the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, collapse, without celebration, you know. Uh, so I give Cole. I mean, he was a, a lousy economic reformer, Cole, but he did grasp the big strategic opportunity, um, and. And he was materially important in the settlement at the end of the Cold War between what was in the Soviet Union with Gorbachev and Yeltsin and the United States. The other one, of course, is Zhu Rongji, the Chinese Premier Zhu Rongji. The Chinese have got Zhu for, for his f four years as, I think it's four years as Deputy Premier and five years as Premier, they have, him, they have to thank him for 25 years of progress. You know, there was no one like him. He loved Australia, he loved the Australian economic model. He loved the things we were doing here, you know, and took a lot of the lessons out of here. That's why he used to, he used to come here a lot. Now, Alan, I want to give you the final word, as this is the Sydney launch of, in a sense, of, of your book. Uh, I know that it's, there's a lot of people that go into making a successful book, so I, I do want to give you the opportunity to, to say a few words. Yeah, no, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Michael. I, I did uh, want to first thank you and the... Lowy Institute, an important part of, uh, of my, uh, my life, but writing the book uh, was a real reminder of the difference that the establishment of this institute made uh, in the early part of, uh, of this century. If you're looking at the nature of the deba debate, of the inputs to the debate before and after the, the Lowy Institute was established, um, it's, uh, it, it represents a really important uh, change and has also helped to sort of generate uh, 
um, you know, other other uh, think tanks uh, as well. So I'm very grateful to Frank Lowy and the and the family um, for uh, for uh, uh, this creation. Um, I secondly wanted to thank uh, my publishers, uh, Murray Schwartz and Chris Fika. Uh, here, to, here, here today um, from Black Ink and La Trobe uh, University Press. They took a punt on two deeply unfashionable subjects, history and, uh, and uh, foreign policy, and also uh, showed that there are, and this astonished me really, there are still publishers around to invest in editing. And, uh, and that's, uh, that was a, 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 reassuring, uh, a reassuring thing. I want to thank the electors of the, uh, the members of the United States Electoral College for a timely uh, re reminder that foreign policy does still matter. Um, and uh, finally, I do want to thank uh, Paul for, uh, for coming along uh, today and for uh, the uh, lessons I've, I've learned. There are a few jobs in uh, that I can imagine more uh, more um, satisfying than being a foreign policy advisor to uh, to a leader like uh, uh, like like him. I went in uh, with some expertise in foreign policy, and I came out of the job with a glimmering of an understanding of statecraft, and statecraft is what we need today. Thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, can I? say some thanks too. First of all, let me join Alan in thanking the electors, uh, the, the members of the Electoral College of, of the United States, because I've, as I've said to some of my colleagues, whether or not Mr Trump is good for the world, he's certainly good for foreign policy think tanks. Um, I want to thank Alan Gingell for coming back and for doing us the honour of, of coming to the Institute to, for the Sydney launch of this important book. Alan is a very important figure in the history of the Institute. We're delighted that he chose here to launch the book. It's a really fantastic read as well as a genuinely important publication. And I think I'm right that Alan is, is happy to sign copies of the book that you can buy from our friends at Glee Books at the conclusion of this event. So thank you, Alan. And secondly, I want to thank Paul Keating for, um, for again, for doing us the honour of speaking to us. I always, every time I interact with Paul, I learn something and I hope everybody here feels the same way. It's very impressive to encounter somebody who has a strategic view and a consistent view of the world. And whether you agree with everything or not, it's thought out um, and it's deeply informed by history and experience. Uh, and we're very grateful, um, grateful for it. Uh, there's a few lines that will stick in my head. Um, always think, um, the it's the smart states who do the dancing. It's the, it's the dumb states who don't do the dancing. Um, I, will, I will think of the sound of battleships going down, Paul, as I'm going to sleep tonight. And finally, he gave us a wonderful piece of career advice for any young people interested in international relations, and that is don't go to law school. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me congratulate Alan again on the publication of his book. Thank you for coming, and please join me in thanking Alan Gingell and Paul Keating. <laughs>